Mark Andreessen, um, a couple of years ago, uh, said that software is eating the world. And, you know, when you think about it, the kinds of massive applications that we run today, things like Facebook with 2 billion monthly users, the number of transactions that PayPal runs every single day, uh, the number of uh, e-commerce transactions that run on Amazon on any given day, these massive applications, we really couldn't even conceive of them 50 years ago. Not only because the uh, performance of the machines was slow and the reliability of the hardware was poor, but nobody had a clue how to build these things and how to scale them out and how to deploy uh, a, a large application. So, you know, we should all take a bow and be proud of ourselves as software engineers uh, for whatever little part we may have contributed to, uh, to getting there. Uh, and it's not just in the U.S. If you go to China, uh, they have comparable things like WeChat. Again, they have hundreds of millions of users uh, all the time. We also have millions of mobile apps, right? I mean, you go to the app store and you can't even find what you're looking for because there are so many. Uh, and uh, we have um, all these highly interconnected platforms. So uh, the infrastructure is such that when you run an app or when you run uh, a web application, you have no clue where it's running. In fact, it's probably running in 50 different places because people have called on services and use that application programming interfaces, and the e-commerce part runs here, and the currency transaction runs there, and the security runs somewhere else, and so on. Uh, so it's that tremendous evolution away from the 50-year-old mainframe environment that um, took a while to get to. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that happened along the way. Now, this is a relatively mature audience, uh, but you know, when you start to talk to people who are uh, significant, significantly younger, <coughs> The idea of a mainframe, of an IBM 360, as the you know, serious fill a room, tape drives, console, yeah, that whole thing is inconceivable to me. Right? So I always want to show one of these things. Um, so today, the A11 processor that's in some mobile phones, it's about 4,000 times faster than what you had in an IBM 360. And of course, you have multiple cores, so you know you get you get even more speed. Um, the uh, amount of core memory in the IBM 360 Model 65, which was not the baby of Valorant, right? it was one megabyte. Okay. Now, you know, maybe I'm dating myself. I didn't use that machine at the time, but I do remember in my first professional job. Uh, writing code that had to run in 13K. 13K. And uh, some of you who've been at this for a while uh, probably remember similar kinds of constraints in the things that, that you wrote. Um, and everything was slow. So people pay a lot of attention to optimization. In fact, you spent a whole lot of your coding time making it fit within the resources and trying to write the most efficient sorting algorithm or the most efficient algorithm for various kinds of things. And even so, many other tasks were infeasible. The things we've talked about today with data science, and artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Well, I wrote a dissertation in artificial intelligence. I'll show you some printouts from it later on. But, you know, what we could do then really pales by comparison, I mean, really pales, uh, when you think about what, what we're able to do now. And of course, the last thing to mention is that you need a lot of space for the machine, right, the 360-65, and uh, the prices were just unbelievable. Uh, you know, certainly by today's standards. So there's a 360-50 with, uh, you know, the, the processor on the left and the tape drives in the back and the console in the front and the rack of tapes here in the lower right foreground and on a raised floor, right? And probably, it didn't show, probably a glass window 
to display what a great machine it was. And if you saw the movie Hidden Figures, you'll remember that uh, they, they had a, a glass window <coughs> display for the machine room. And it wasn't until people started worrying about security that they took away the glass windows. So, how about software back then? Well, I think, again, some of us recall how many years it took to make OS 360 work. In fact, Fred Brooks wrote a great book called The Mythical Man Month, which in part details the efforts of his thousand-man team, mostly men, uh, to build OS 360. And the programming language that came with it, PL1, uh, it took them seven years to build a compiler, and even that didn't work. That's probably why you didn't hear much of PL1. Um, now, how, how did you estimate how long it was going to take to build a program? Well, you know, you put your finger up in the sky, and you guessed, because we didn't really have any handles on it. We're not that great at it now, but then it was just random. So, um, was there a software industry? Well, not much of one. And one of the reasons for that was that there wasn't any platform that enough people owned. And so you had what we called at the time Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. IBM was Snow White, of course. And GE and Honeywell and RCA and Control Data and uh, a couple of the others uh, you know, had small but, not, but you know, significant market shares. Uh, totaling about 30% of the overall market. Uh, but it wasn't until the 360 came out that you had a whole range of machines that ran the same instruction set, right? and which supported the same languages and compilers, which made it reasonable for somebody to go out <coughs> and write a program that would run on all of them and sell it. Prior to that, software was pretty much given away. IBM had shares. They still have it. Uh, as a user group, <coughs> people share their software. But in 1965, Autoflow came along. That was most people credit as the first commercial software. And it generated flow charts from, from code. Okay. And it was a successful product. People made money. Uh, the other thing that was going on at the time was that there were these large software projects that people were trying to, to build. It was, air defense, there was airline reservation <coughs> systems, there was air traffic control, there were banking systems, um, and more. And all of these projects had one thing in common. They were in trouble. And so uh, some of them never happened. I mean, you know, the FBI took decades to try to put together a case system to keep track of the people that they thought were the bad guys. You know, it was just one thing after another, millions and millions of dollars spent on these systems that, in many cases, never came to, to pass. So the term software engineering came about 50 years ago this year. Uh, Professor Bauer, uh, who was uh, computer science faculty in the Technische Universität München, I didn't get my right in German, sorry about that, guys. Uh, but um, he came up with the term. And of course, the term was, why can't we engineer software the way that we engineer other things? Well, if you try to engineer other things, you know that when you try to engineer them for the first time, they have problems too. And the same problems. Cost overruns, delays, incomplete specifications, all the things that we have as problems in software, they have in hardware, so we were not alone. But uh, Bauer was actually a, a very good organizer and a very good wheeler dealer. Um, I got to know him a little bit because his wife babysat for my son once upon a time. Uh, <laughs> and we all went out to dinner. And everybody at the table spoke German, and my German is like Kleinischian. Um, anyway. Uh, so he managed to get Nader to pay for these workshops, uh, the first one anyway. And the first one was held in Garmisch-Partenkirchen, which is a very nice town uh, in the Alps, about an hour and a half south of Munich. 
home to a casino and some ski runs and the like. Um, and then subsequently uh, another meeting in, in Rome. And the sessions, interestingly enough, and you can go find these proceedings, they're online and they're available for free. Um, it wasn't just technical issues. They realized that they were business issues. They were problems of you know, communication between a customer and the developer, a problem that we see to, to this very, very day. And the people who came came from academia and industry and from government. So uh, this is the building in which they had the meeting. Uh, I took this photo uh, when the European Software Engineering Conference was held there uh, in the early 90s. Uh, but you can see the slopes uh, behind it. Uh, now, I talked about ESEC, but of course, uh, the, uh, the conference that people know best is the International Conference on Software Engineering. And I've had the uh, good fortune, I guess, to have gone to a lot of them. Uh, but not all, me, not all of them by any means. But, so what you'll see as we go along are some photos. So the second International Conference on Software Engineering was in 1976 uh, in San Francisco. And uh, that's a picture from the San Francisco side, taken long before that. So when we look at that 360-65 and laugh that we actually could have done any useful work on a machine that constrained, we also look at the advances that have come along in hardware since then. And they're very, very substantial. So we can look at all these things like uh, PCs, right? going back to the Altair probably, and since then, alphanumeric and bitmap displays, um, networking and distributed systems. Initially, all these proprietary networking things, but eventually uh, standardization around the Ethernet. Uh, Large-scale connected storage. So, you know, the first rotating disks uh, were like five megabytes and sold for you know, $25,000 or something like that. I mean, just flash memory, mobile devices, cloud computing, sensors and connected devices. And if you like, quantum computing. Though it's not quite clear how that's going to fit in as we go. So, what's going on behind the scenes? faster processors, miniaturization, cheaper memory, display technology, higher bandwidth, and also improved battery life, which I think is going to uh, be increasingly important as we uh, give our lives more and more to mobile devices. Well, what happens with these hardware advances is that they make it possible to do certain things in software that weren't doable before. And that's really a critical thing. So if only I had a bitmap display, I could do this. If only I had a sensor device that could pick up this signal, I could do that. And this is what we can see through personal computers made compute consumer packaged software possible. Until people had personal machines, well, you know, what are you going to do with this you know, tax program or this game? Sure, we had games on time sharing systems. And you know, some of you may remember snakes and uh, some of these um, uh, hunt the wampus, right? You really have to be in tune with Unix to uh, remember hunt the wampus. Um, uh, so then we got bitmap displays and we could make more sophisticated games. Uh, but we also had windowing systems that came out of it, graphical user interfaces, the whole area of computers and human interaction. Uh, and user experience grew out of that. Uh, networking and distributed systems made it possible for the web to work and for us to do even routine things like email. Right. So uh, large-scale connected storage lets us do database management systems. Um, you know, we had database management systems uh, really in the late 60s. Uh, they first uh, were around, but it wasn't until SQL came along and uh, Oracle decided to jump on that that you really had this uh, huge growth in uh, relational database management. Touch screens uh, gave us uh, some new capabilities with tablets and with mobile applications. 
uh, the mobile devices themselves gave us this explosion of applications starting back in the late 1990s when NTT in Japan uh, led the way in the development of mobile applications and app stores and, and so on. Uh, cloud computing gives us these massive scalable applications uh, that, that we were talking about at the outset here. And of course, sensors and connected devices give us the possibility of ubiquitous connectivity, uh, which raises a whole lot of questions. Uh, we probably won't have much time to talk about all of them tonight, but the idea that um, you, know, you have smart doorbells and smart refrigerators and uh, smart beds. Smart beds, I love this one because uh, you know, you can use the data to figure out who's sleeping when and how many people are sleeping and, um, or what else they're doing in their bed. We're probably going to leave that one right there. Uh, so, um, ICSI kept moving around the world. Uh, number eight was in London. Number 10 was in Singapore. But let's come back to this um, issue of these advances. And we talked about all these hardware advances, and we talked about the hardware advances enabling certain kinds of software advances. And somebody said to me, well, are there errors? You know, can we say that the 60s were this and the 70s were that? And the answer is sort of. But the problem is that they overlap. So we can say about the 1960s, the, the early days of software engineering, that the early work in programming, programming methodology, right, stepwise refinement, top-down design, those kinds of things really uh, came out in some of the early talks and papers uh, on programming methodology. Some of the early work on uh, formalisms and trying to prove programs correct also came out of that era. Uh, the idea of the software life cycle came soon thereafter. The idea of a waterfall model, of course, came from Wynne Royce, uh, among other people, uh, in about 1970. And uh, as we can see, we're still in the era of software life cycle, but we'll come back to this and we'll talk about the different kinds of life cycles that exist today and how they've evolved. There was a discussion in the mid-70s about requirements and specifications. There was a fairly sizable community of people who thought that requirements and specifications were not part of software engineering. The focus was on design and implementation. Okay. But suddenly, people started asking the questions, well, how can you test your program or prove your program correct if you don't know what it's supposed to do in the first place. And this led to work on requirements and specifications and formal notations and assertions and all that kind of thing. Um, tools, computer-aided software engineering uh, to support development processes. Again, you can look back before that, uh, some of the early programming environments. Interlisp is probably the best known of the early programming, language, uh, programming environments, but basic. You know, which was developed at Dartmouth University. It was the same idea. You, know, you were interacting with a tool that helped you edit, run, and see the results of your programming. So um, after 1980, and you had bitmap displays and workstations, you could do a lot more sophisticated things. And, and today, uh, as we'll see a little later on, they, uh, the, the kinds of tools that you have available to you are really uh, very sophisticated. Uh, in 1988, brought the capability maturity model from the Software Engineering Institute, which was funded by the United States Department of Defense uh, to uh, try to help organizations figure out what key processes they had to put in place to have a uh, repeatable and dependable and eventually an optimized software process. And uh, some system integrators and contractors put a lot of effort into uh, demonstrating that they had a high level of process maturity because uh, that would help them get business. Okay. So the uh, capability maturity model uh, had an important impact on the way that people uh, did software development, 
particularly in contract software development for the government and to a lesser extent in, in telecom and a couple of other industries. Um, the web, of course, was a huge tr transformation because it made everyone a user. You know, before that, you kind of had to have the, the secret ingredients and wear the right cap uh, to be thought of as a user of computers. But you know, by 1994, there was a lot of personal software around the uh, PC and the Mac. Uh, it had been around a decade or more. There were lots of uh, packaged applications for them. So more and more people were comfortable using computers. And then when you threw in networking, whether it was Prodigy or um, eventually AOL, um, I think I got an AOL account in 1994. Uh, I, pro I probably still have that email address. Um, so, uh, but of course, that wasn't really the web for a long time. Um, it, you know, Mosaic in, in 1993, and eventually Netscape and Internet Explorer. You know, those gave people access, and of course, we all know what happened with the dot-com boom and uh, subsequent uh, bust. Mobile apps from the late 1990s, again, brought a whole new uh, range of issues. First of all, performance became a bit more of an issue because you had fewer resources on the uh, early mobile phones. Uh, you had screen space as an issue, how do you take you know, would you display it on the web in a lot of space and display it in a small amount of space? Uh, so there are a lot of issues there. Also, uh, how do you build your distributed application? Do you build something native? Do you build something that's hybrid? Do you build you know, distributed in other ways? And now, uh, the last 10 years or so, we've seen a lot more by way of ubiquitous computing. Uh, many of us have wearable fitness devices that connect to uh, our, our home computers via Bluetooth, for example. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of other kinds of sensor applications. And there are more, right? Because they're showing up in automobiles and they're showing up in uh, a lot of other places. So, uh, so we can think of these as eras. But another way to think of it is major departures. That is, for each one of these things, we had to make some changes in the way that we thought about software, the kind of applications we designed, how we went about it, the significance of the user, uh, the, the way that we made efficient use of the technology. All of these things are still with us, but uh, each has evolved independently. And I'll try to give you some sense of that as we go. XC12 went to Nice one of my favorite places. Uh, so when we think about those um, errors, what I want to do is pull out what are the software themes? What are the topics that we keep coming back to? And those themes, in many cases, cover lots of different errors because we've had to deal with tools all along. We need different tools when we enter a different era. Like we use different languages when we enter a different era. So I try to uh, keep within the magic number seven plus or minus two here. I just barely did it. Um, so abstraction, modularity, architecture, notations, development teams, product quality, user experience, reuse, tools and automated support, and management. So those are not totally orthogonal to one another. There's some overlap uh, between them, among them. Uh, but um, I, what I'd like to do is try to touch on each of those in order and show you a little bit of the evolution of these themes from their uh, original purpose uh, to uh, where we are now and use that. You can use it, in fact as a basis for projecting where do we go next? You know, where, where are these ideas taking us? They're going to take us to Berlin. Uh, when we think about abstraction, abstraction is really a fundamental cognitive notion. Right? We talk about a car. 
fine. Okay, so there's a class of cars, right? And you can drill down on that abstract notion we talked about sizes and brands and power and all kinds of detail. But if I tell you, you know, there are cars on the freeway, you know, you get the idea because we're using a, a well understood abstraction. Um, but at the system software level, operating systems are an abstraction away from the hardware. Database management systems are an abstraction away from the file system, away from the rotating or um, flash device. Uh, networks, again, they high, right. If you look at, at networks and you look at the OSI network model, right, there's seven levels of abstraction. So you know, this is the fundamental way that we think. Programming languages the same way. Right, so when we look at programming languages, we have procedural languages that support certain kinds of abstractions. We have um, both procedural and functional languages that, that do that. Right? So if you go back to Lisp, you, know, you have an abstraction of the predicate calculus. And that has kind of followed through over the years. You look at scientific programming, uh, you know, again, you're abstracting away from the hardware, away from the uh, assembly language uh, instruction set to a higher level, which gets either interpreted or uh, compiled uh, and, and executed. Objects are an abstraction. So we've all spent a lot of time with object-oriented models and object-oriented <coughs> languages and object-oriented databases. Uh, but if you, again, if you look at the origins, you have things like Simula 67 and Smalltalk as key programming languages that brought the uh, object ideas to the programmer to, to use as a way to think about uh, program organizations. Of course, today we have many, many other object-oriented programming languages, uh, some of which are in routine production use, others of which are you know, part of a research community. The idea of frameworks. Uh, the first framework that I could find was Mac App, right, 1985. And what did it tell you? It told you that if you were going to build something to run on what was then system five, six, an, an early version of, uh, of what, of course, uh, evolved uh, as, as the classic Mac operating system. Uh, that Mac app framework made it easier for you because it gave you certain abstractions. Right? And you had Windows, for example, as an abstraction. You had pointers in this, as an abstraction. So you didn't have to actually go down there in the hardware and figure out how to move that device. Okay. So today, abstractions are everywhere the, in frameworks. Right? There are hundreds of GUI frameworks for web applications. There are uh, lots of frameworks for uh, back-end. Right? People use Angular and React and things like that. They're JavaScript-based, or JSON-based. .NET is a framework. So again, all this does is it lets you think in a way that's more natural for you because it gets you away from thinking about all those circuits that are doing their thing. The virtual machines. Okay. So uh, I was talking to somebody today, and uh, we were talking about some ancient machine. And he said, well, you know, you can probably emulate that today. Hmm. Of course. Right? So uh, I have um, uh, VMware software running on this machine, and I have, you know, and I can bring up other operating systems besides Mac OS if I want to do that. Um, but the idea of virtual machines goes way back. You know, the idea of time sharing goes into the 1960s. You know, when we did time sharing long, long ago, you thought that you had the whole machine. Ha ha. You didn't. You were sharing it with some number of other uh, applications and users, and there was some traffic cop 
uh, which was the operating system, which swapped one program in and swapped another one out. Okay. So the idea of that virtualization is, is not new. The, also, you have abstractions like stack machine architectures. Well, OK. That was really nice, by the way, especially if you were writing a compiler. Having a stack machine architecture was great. Um, but you know, that wasn't what was on the hardware. Right? That was the instruction set, and then the, you know, the next level is abstraction up. And today we have containers. right? So you have um, Docker and Kubernetes and so on. <coughs> When we think about modularity and architecture, there's a lot of overlap uh, with, with abstraction. But when we think about software architectures, we had client server, we have right, model view controller architectures, we have um, all kinds of frameworks and libraries uh, that uh, uh, we can use. We can use cloud computing, and if we use any of the most popular uh, cloud computing services and frameworks, OpenStack, or AWS, or Azure, or uh, any of a number of others, uh, you know, they provide abstraction that says, oh, I need you know, a bunch more processors, or I need more storage, or I need less, and just does it, right? There's a management process in there that is like a distributed operating system, if you think about it. Okay. And again, the idea of cloud computing is not all that new. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I remember reading a book called The Challenge of the Computer Utility. Hmm. Well, that's more, that's a long time ago. Hmm. Okay. Now, they could have built one at the time, <laughs> but the idea certainly was, was there and in place. <laughs> I've got to say a few words about this picture. Um, I used to consult the Digital Equipment Corporation, which was a great company, and it was a sad ending, but Ken L. Olson didn't believe in personal computers, and the rest of the world did, and that was the beginning of the end. But Digital Equipment, uh, their main offices were about 30 miles west of, the, of Boston. And driving out there was a bit of a slog. So they ran their own airline. <laughs> Helicopters. <laughs> Helicopters. So they had a gate Logan Airport. And you could, if you had the right status, you could book a seat on the helicopter. Great. I mean, one of the best <laughs> perks of being a consultant that I ever had. And so this photo was taken by me uh, in Dex helicopter. Uh, so this is Boston Harbor, right? because the airport's on the other side of the harbor. I have another one somewhere that was uh, uh, full foliage in New England, uh, also on the way out to Maynard, Massachusetts. So uh, there we go. Oh, I was also a co-chair of ICSI-19 in Boston. So that was 20 years ago. All right. So another one of these software themes was uh, notations. So programming languages, of course. Right? So uh, if you've been doing this a while, then Fortran and COBOL and Algol and probably assembler language were the uh, notations that you used. Um, some of those got compiled. Some of them got interpreted. Some of them got compiled to an intermediate form. So today, we're all very familiar with Java bytecode. And you know that you can have lots of languages that compile into Java bytecode and those get interpreted. Again, that's not a new thing. You can go back and look at the Amsterdam compiler kit. It was done a long time ago and essentially did the same thing. All right. It compiled various programming languages into an in intermediate form and, and then interpreted the intermediate form. Um, we had domain-specific languages. Uh, if you did, sci did scientific computing or systems programming, you may have gone from Fortran to Pascal to C to C++ to Java and maybe to Python. And the new generation, right, people are using Rust and Go and Swift. Right? You know, are they going to replace uh, all of the others? Probably not, okay, because people 
you know, tend to stick by their first love. Uh, but, um, but the evolution of programming languages continues. Uh, if you like functional languages, you can follow Lisp to Haskell and Scala, right, that are all out there. And if you look at some of these coding schools, they teach you JavaScript. Now, ugly, ugly thing, but JavaScript it is. And some of the automated tools that you use to build graphical user interfaces for uh, mobile applications, they generate JavaScript. And if you think coding your own JavaScript is ugly, take a look at what the tools generate automatically. Don't even think about modifying it. Um, then we have notations for modeling. So again, if you go way back, people use the transition diagrams, people use uh, flow charts. Uh, and then uh, when all these software design methods came about in the 1970s and early 80s, we saw structure charts, we saw data flow diagrams, we saw entity relationship models. And by the late 90s, we saw UML, which was sort of take everything and throw it into one notation. Uh, and again, there are more notations that people have used, uh, particularly in sp specific domains. How do teams of people work together? That's evolved a lot, and it's an important theme because you know, early on, if you think about the way um, some of the early software development shops work, take, take IBM as an example, everybody went to work. Everybody had an office. You had meetings. You had a desk. Uh, and so people worked in the office, and they all were co-located, and that was how the team worked. Um, and they followed a waterfall model, typically. Now, we all know what some of the shortcomings of waterfall models are. And uh, it took a while to discover them. Uh, but um, Barry Bain was among the first people to lead people in the direction of iterative development, spiral models, do a bit at a time. Do you think that sounds a lot like sprints and today's scrum? Yeah. You bet. Okay, so you can actually trace how we got here from there. Okay. Uh, object oriented development. One of the other things that went on with development teams was that there came a point at which everybody didn't have to be in the same physical location. And there's been a lot of discussion, and companies have taken a lot of positions on this. You know, is everybody going to be there? Are you going to all share a whiteboard? Or maybe you can share a virtual whiteboard. Or maybe you can be on internet relay chat. Or maybe you can be on Slack or Mattermost right, as a way to get the team to coordinate without necessarily being in the same physical location. The Agile Manifesto in 2001 uh, brought together some uh, key influencers and uh, has turned out to be very important in getting people to think about uh, a much more agile and subsequently a more lean process for creating software. You know, there's a lot of waste that went on in software processes and there's, of course, the traditional problem of not seeing what you've got until much, much later, and by which time the requirements have changed, and we all know how this story ends. Not well. So there's been a lot more uh, encouragement to do things and release things early and often because we have the technology now to make changes quickly and to make those changes available to, to our users. That was, turns out to be a really, really significant landmark in the history of software development. In 1994, Netscape was the next big thing, right? And so you had Netscape Navigator. And, you know, they put out Netscape Navigator, and you could get a CD. But the other thing that happened was that they wanted to make changes, right? The web was evolving quickly. And as developers, they were in a rush to get stuff out. So maybe they 
focused on quality as much as we might all have liked them to do so. Because, let's face it, they wanted to go public. And they did. It was a huge IPO. Was the quality of their software any good? Not really. They made 15 releases of Netscape. <coughs> but did they have to manufacture any media? No, they didn't. They were the first to really get the idea that you could write crummy software, make it available to your users, who then had to do the download at dial-up speeds in 1994. <laughs> right? And if it didn't work, well, they'd do it tomorrow. Right? And they put out a new version. You think I'm kidding. They did 15 versions of Netscape 4. Actually, Microsoft was doing that already. <laughs> well, not quite. Not, not the download. No, that Microsoft was not doing it because, because most companies had the idea that you ship a major release once a year and you ship a minor release maybe halfway in between. And now if you look at Microsoft, what do they do? They're, they're already talking about Office 2019, which is going to ship in late 2018. So it's a three-year release cycle. Um, you know, whereas all their competition are, you know, releasing things like now. Um, so, uh, but the idea that you could download had a tremendous impact on software companies. You know, I, had, I ran a company, you know, and we built a product. I'll show you a screenshot later on. But when we made a release, we had to manufacture a tape or a CD. We had to ship it to customers. Now, if we screwed up, we had to do it again. It didn't come for free. Right? We had to manufacture them again. We had a release engineering guy who stayed up all night making sure that they all got made, labeled, put in envelopes, shipped, what have you. And of course, then our support team and our sales engineers had to help the customers install the new version. So, you know, that was kind of uh, inefficient in many, many different ways and had an impact on a lot of people. So the idea that you as a software vendor could now push the job onto the user, how great is that? And that's what we see today with mobile apps, right? They're automatically downloaded and it's easy to install them and you wake up in the morning and there's 11 apps waiting to be updated. Uh, every morning. Uh, so, which brings us to continuous development. Right? The idea is that, you know, we're going to release early, release often, we're going to make some changes, and now we're going to declare this dot version finish. I started using um, a PDF reader um, on the Mac very early when they first started out, and they made 36 releases before they got to 1.0. 36. I went back and looked. So that's a different model, right? The teams work differently. So, uh, and of course, now we have DevOps, uh, which is an effort to be able to take what you've developed and then you know, get it out there into the world quickly. And tools like Chef and Puppet I've been around about a decade that um, helped that. There's a lot more in the way of DevOps, but we'll skip that for now. Uh, this is Toronto, Chinatown in Toronto. So um, I already talked about some of these issues about how teams collaborate. Right? This, this list really illustrates the transition from everybody in the room together, you know, physical meetings, somebody's taking notes to the way we live today, which is typically a lot of remote workers, um, a mix of employees and contractors, uh, conference calls, video call, chats, Slack, all these kinds of techniques that uh, are intended to enable people to work more efficiently together. And it allows you to hire people wherever they happen to be. So 
Uh, there are any number of software companies that have their sales and marketing and executive headquarters here in the Bay Area, and the development team is halfway around the world in one direction or the other. Uh, because there are smart people all over the world, and as long as they have the infrastructure uh, and uh, you can speak a common language, you can make it work. And that's what happens. So the issue of product quality, I already alluded to that with the uh, story about, about Netscape, but you know, there are some applications for which product quality is paramount. Right? If somebody is going to operate on you and insert a pacemaker, you know, not only do you want it to work properly, but actually you'd like to be able to see the code. <laughs> and. Um, uh, there are people who are having uh, you know, ongoing discussions with companies like Medtronic uh, that say, you know, show me that you're not unduly using the battery. Show me that you're not calling home every 20 minutes. Because, you know, if that happens, then the battery runs down, and guess what? You're back in the operating room. Uh, so, um, but in a lot of cases, uh, when we're dealing with non-critical applications, the testing is not as thorough or severe as we might want it to be. Uh, the open source community for a long time uh, relied on its community to take uh, an early version of some software and beat on it and file issue reports and then have the uh, team of commuters uh, sign up to make those fixes and do a nightly build and, and make, it, make it available. But those ideas from the open source community percolated into other places. In fact, PayPal uses open source processes for their own internal software. It's called their source. And, uh, and they're actually quite, uh, quite effective and quite well known for their, for their work uh, in that area. But um, Beyond that, we have all kinds of other um, issues that people are going at for quality, not just correctness, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, but performance and efficient use of resources. If you write a mobile app and it eats the battery because it keeps a constant HTTP connection, it works right, but you're not very happy with it. Um, so you have all these non-functional requirements around reliability, performance, scalability, security, of course. So you have to test for a bunch of these non-functional things as well as uh, for uh, functionality. And you have a whole range of tools that people use. How are you going to simulate a million users coming to your website at, all at once? You know, you know, are you going to, is your site going to die when that happens? Or can you dynamically allocate resources uh, in the cloud to handle the surge in, in user traffic? So people you know, test for that. So, so product quality means much more than you know, it doesn't calculate the right answer. It means uh, all these other things that are uh, non-functional. So you get all these different aspects of testing, which are you know, acceptance testing and unit testing stress testing, scalability, performance, and, uh, of course, usability testing. And there are many organizations that now really put a lot of emphasis on user experience, and uh, you know, they bring people in and they observe them. And when you install a lot of uh, software or use certain websites, you may notice that the uh, provider of that software tells you that they collect data. Would you be okay without collecting your data anonymously? Well, that's a form of testing too. They want to know how you're going to use it, which functions you're using, which one, where, where's the code spending its time in the back. So, all these aspects of testing come into play. Uh, Edinburgh was 2004 for ICSI, and it actually, uh, when I went there, it's the um, ICSI conference that led to my having my current job. So, uh, that tech helicopter really travels far. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was uh, from a tower. Right? 
you know, the thing about photography is you really have to be in the right place at the right time. You don't need $5,000 worth of computing equipment. <laughs> if you're in the right place at the right time, your phone works. All right, so user experience. Um, you know, the idea of contextual design as a way to understand how people are going to use the application that you're building. That's a really important uh, process for uh, defining requirements and, uh, uh, and then going back and validating them. Uh, we have all these technology dependencies. So, you know, the user interface, when I first, uh, when I was in graduate school, the first interactive programs I wrote, Ran on a TTY 33. Yeah, you can go to the Computer History Museum and see one. <laughs> uh, and they they are um, 72 characters wide, uppercase only, because there's only five bytes, right? The oh, yeah. uh, 26 characters and the nine digits, um, and um, yeah. Uh, then we moved on to alphanumeric displays before GUI and the web, mobile, and now smart devices where, again, all bets are off in terms of what should be a standard user interface. So uh, I promised to show you this. Uh, this is um, TTY. It's a t I actually had the real, I have the real TTY output. So this is a, a poor quality uh, copy of it for my dissertation. Um, but you can sort of see what the user output looked like. And there was a whole part of my uh, work that had to do with the user interaction. And you know, you can imagine somebody who's never seen a computer before, because this was the, you know, the 1960s. Um, and you put them at a TTY 33 terminal. And you say, here's your bridge hand. Make a bid. Yeah. It was really pretty revolutionary in its own way. Uh, so TTY 33. All right. Shanghai for XC28. So reuse has turned out to be really uh, another area that's changed a lot. You know, for a very long time, companies talked about, oh, we're going to have a reuse program. We're going to get you to uh, contribute your uh, the successful software to a library in our company and we'll share it and document it and make it available to others. How many of you worked in organizations that tried to do that? Yeah, failure, right? Failure all around. Okay. For any number of reasons, uh, most of which is that people didn't like use, uh, what I would call used code. Right? You know, not invented here. I didn't write this. I don't trust it. So that was the mentality for a very long time. But today the mentality is totally different. Because people use frameworks, they use libraries, they use open source software. And what's really significant today, particularly in the startup world, is you want to get your product out as quickly as you can. Which means writing fewer lines of code. The world doesn't need another database management system. Well, maybe it does, but you're not going to be the one to write it, at least not on your release 1.0 or 0.4. So the mentality is very, very different. Now, where can I get this code? What does it do? And if you don't know what it does, you go to Stack Overflow and ask. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. And people tell you. We were just joking about it here. They, they, you know, they may say nasty things about you as a newbie, but you're going to get the answer you need faster than calling up somebody's technical support line. So this notion of a community to encourage people to use software to figure out what's wrong, um, you know, is really um, very, very different than it once was. So, you know, where we formerly prioritized writing code, we now prioritize getting something out. We were talking about cutting and pasting the error message out and put it in Google. Great. <laughs> and you get the answer. All right. right. So, you know, and one of the things that makes it possible to do all this are improved tools. So we've gone from things like Interlist and to much more sophisticated programming environments. Uh, if you do uh, Java development, 
you probably use Eclipse, and if you don't, you probably use IntelliJ. And you know, those are two really very powerful programming environments. And you may use other kinds of tools uh, for, for programming environments. Uh, we had computer and software engineering tools. I'll show you one in a moment. Um, version control, configuration management, down a list of things that uh, people need. Um, you know, when we built user interfaces way back when, we got our graph paper and we drew grids and we drew boxes. Painful. Or we used Visio to, you know, for something that it shouldn't have been used for. But today, you know, we have storyboarding tools, we have mock-up screens, we have Balsamic, we have all kinds of really cool products for uh, designing and testing and tweaking user interfaces. Um, testing, we have, you know, starting with JUnit and going on. And then, of course, collaboration, workflow support, integration and DevOps. We've talked about all those as we've gone along. And there are tools that support each of those things. That's what's really important in a lot of situations. Having a process in place is fine. Having tools that make it easier to do that process makes it better. That was one of my objections to the capability maturity model. Because they talked about, here are my key, key process areas. But as far as they were concerned in their documents, you could have done it with pencil and paper. They didn't pay any attention to the talent of the people who were performing the processes. They didn't provide. They didn't talk about the working environment. They didn't talk about the tool support. And all those make a huge difference in whether your process Work successfully or not. As, so um, I started and ran interactive development environments. We built software through pictures. It was one of the first applications to run on the Sun workstation. Uh, we built our own windowing system initially because Sun didn't provide one for a while. Uh, eventually they did. And so here are some data flow diagrams and the hidden window down there, but you know, having all that 19 inches of bitmap display, that was really a huge change. So, hmm. woo -hoo. All right. so uh, there's Vancouver's high rises. Uh, seen uh, if you know Vancouver, Stanley Park is right on the water, and so you can look across the water and you can see the uh, uh, the boats and the high rises downtown. So. Management of all of this uh, takes, uh, takes a lot of skill. I, I teach a course uh, both at the university and independently it's called the first time manager. You know, because one of, the thing, one of the things we see with uh, startups in particular is that people who are really strong technically suddenly become managers. And they don't have that experience and they don't know what the techniques are. Um, so, there have been a lot of ideas tried around management. Uh, one of the ones that got a lot of attention was in the 1970s when IBM uh, came up with this idea called the Chief Programmer Team. And basically what it was about was if you've got a superstar, then let the superstar do his thing, and it was a he. Um, and then everything else exists to support that guy's work. Now, Google does this today, right? They feed you, they uh, drive you to and from work, they take care of your laundry. Um, it's, a, it, it's got a certain resemblance to it. But, but what happened, at the time at least, was that uh, the world discovered that there weren't all that many people who fit the model of chief programmer team, of a chief programmer. Yeah, maybe Bill Joy. And we, we can all point to a few people we know who were an order of magnitude better than everybody else, but there weren't really that many of them. So we've tried a whole bunch of different management techniques, um, agile management, which basically means get out of the way, uh, and uh, uh, various <laughs> metrics for processing, communication schemes. And eventually, one of the things that's turned out to be really important is the product manager. Okay. So the product manager, in many cases, 
isn't much of a developer. Maybe they've had some computer science, maybe they're a programmer, but not hardcore. But what they're good at is communicating. Right? And they're the ones who can interact with the development team and with the people who are going to use the program and pay for it. Right? So that communication skill says, all right, we can figure out what's important to our customers. We can create a product roadmap that says, these features have to be in this program, in this version, because if they're not, nobody's going to use it. And oh, by the way, the competition already has it. So the, the, the link between marketing and development used to be separate. In our, com in our company, you know, the marketing team and the sales guys were on one floor, and the developers were on another floor. And of course, the marketing team went home in the afternoon, and the engineering team didn't show up till early afternoon and stayed <laughs> late in the day. It's the same today. So, uh, but, but today the, the role of the product manager is really uh, can serve as a glue between marketing and you know, dealing with user facing issues and engineering, so schedules, and deciding on prioritization and features and so on. So that's really an important issue in software engineering. And it's one that you don't think of if you just uh, have your blinders on to, uh, to software, uh, to the software by itself. Uh, Table Mountain in the background there in Cape Town. That was 2010. So how are we doing? You know, I've kind of swept through all these eras and all these themes and all these topics and maybe some of the tools uh, that I've mentioned are familiar to you. Are we doing better? Absolutely. It may not seem that way every morning, but um, particularly when you know the East Coast server goes down or something like that, um, and everything comes to a total halt, or your favorite ISP uh, decides that uh, they're going to update the operating system on their server bank, and then you know we're all out of business for a while, but. You know, in the early days, we had slow machines. We had to write all the code ourselves. We didn't know how to manage large development teams. Yeah, we're not perfect at those things now. But we have machines that are many, many times more powerful than we had before. Um, in fact, they're so powerful that we can write bad code. Right? A lot of today's developers don't really focus on writing efficient code as much as we did in previous years because the machines are sufficiently fast that unless you've done something really blatantly awful, um, you know, it'll get hidden. Um, we have really good integrated development environments and we have, of course, decades of experience with best practices. So people come in, they have, you know, they come in, they, they've done it before. They know what, they, what tools they want to have. They're going to put them all together. Uh, they put together a team that uh, works harmoniously and so on. So we're getting closer to the present day. This is Zurich in 2012. Now, you know, I talked about our moving forward, but there's some backsliding. Uh, I think we all see some of these coding camps and hackathons and some of these things where really um, no software engineering principles are followed. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, yes, I can write code. Um, but, but at some point, you know, there's some discipline that we have that lets us call, think of ourselves as software engineers as opposed to hackers or programmers. Um, and uh, that reflects a certain uh, maturity and education. So uh, there gets to be a little bit of uh, confusion in all of this. But the people who are enthusiastic about doing development, we can make them better developers. And that's something that's on, on us as software engineers. You can see came back to San Francisco. I took this photo from Twin Peaks. So now somebody said, OK, Tony, you've talked for an hour. What are the key advances? 
Now, are there a few things that we can point to that are really uh, significant? And I tried to keep it to one slide, and I couldn't hold it to nine. I have ten. Uh, you could maybe group them for me. But programming, programming methodology, for example, the impact of structured programming in the early 70s and the discussion that went around on that was very influential. Pascal came out of that effort, right? And people learned how to write well-structured programs. Uh, so that was really important. Uh, Unix and C uh, was used by you know, millions of students around the world in almost every decent computer science department. Um, then Sun commercialized it, and you know, everybody who went out and bought Sun servers and, uh, uh, or their competitors ended up using C and Unix. Um, that really uh, got people thinking about the definition of functions and the openness and the published APIs and all these kinds of things that were documented in Unix and routinely used. And when you wrote your own stuff, you used the Unix manual format. Software Engineering Institute was very influential. It was an important advance. It got people thinking about software processes and what are the, what are the things that are important in a process to, to, to do. Uh, open source was critical. Uh, when I was at uh, UC San Francisco, we shipped open source software with a BSD license in 1980. That was long before Linux and MySQL and the like. But, uh, but obviously, uh, you go to GitHub today, and there's 70 million projects out there. Not all of them are open source. Not all of them are maintained. But still, 70 million is a big number. Um, web browsers, of course, transformed the world uh, because they gave a, a customer-facing, easy way to access information. Development environments, abstractions we've talked about, these massive applications are really um, not something we easily could have foreseen. Agile development, as with BSCI, you know, is an important transition in the way that we think about building things. Uh, another area that I didn't mention that you really might not think of as software engineering is are these low code applications. People can put up their own blogs, they can do WordPress, they can do Drupal. Um, all of these things are free and you can get your website up and running you know, within an hour. Um, and there are other website design tools, but that's you know, you can use Rapid Weaver or Weebly or, you know, the list is long. Uh, but the idea that everybody can you know, have their own website comes from that. So these advances can't come to me as, you know, maybe not all the things that are important, but 10 that, that particularly are. Uh, it's Florence, not with a helicopter, but uh, <laughs> uh, there's a piazza uh, on the south side of the river. <laughs> Uh, that's up high. Yeah. Yeah, the Piazza that's Michelangelo. My bad. Hmm? That's yeah. where the museums are on the south side. Right? Yeah, yeah, but this is up, up the hill on the other side. So what's coming next? Well, okay, of course, more development tools and, and methods. Um, you know, we're going to have more of these software-related crises. Yahoo reports 3 billion accounts compromised. <laughs> Equifax, 145 million. Um, but you know, you can just imagine autonomous vehicles having a problem, stopping in the middle of the road because they don't know what's going on in the fog. Right? You know, you bring an you know, autonomous vehicle to the west side of San Francisco in January or in July, and where am I? Um, so you know, a lot of these things uh, that I list under software-related crises I mentioned because what we do in software is newsworthy. For a long time, it left us alone. Right? But now, when you have these things that affect millions and millions of people, if not billions, you know, when something happens, it's front page news. Not only is it front page news, it's social media news. So it you know, gets circulated very, very quickly. Um, 
I think we're going to continue to revisit this issue about licensing and certification of developers, particularly around uh, issues of hacking and cybersecurity. Uh, that's a discussion that's been going on for decades. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Um, governments are getting more and more interested. Most governments have policies about open source, for example. The United States is relatively good. The countries that are the best are not the ones you would guess. They're Brazil, and Norway, and France, probably the three that I would pick as the most advanced about open source. But there are policies. Tomorrow night, I, uh, I'm going to a meeting. I'm on the advisory committee for an open source voting project in San Francisco. Uh, so do you think the government's interested in that one? You bet. Um, so larger government roles. And then we're going to see more hardware advances. I mentioned quantum computing earlier. I'm not sure what's going to happen here. So um, we're at at least the new part. Um, I'm going to skip this future management challenges in the interest of time. Uh, next year, we're going to Gothenburg. And this is where I, I want to conclude, which is software is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It is critical global infrastructure. The world does not run without software. When the air traffic control system goes down, the planes don't fly. And when the reservation systems go down, the airline doesn't fly. And we can pick one thing after another where the significance of properly running software determines you know, what's going on. We spend time talking about cyber warfare and, and hacking into uh, other countries' uh, computers for political or economic gain, uh, you know, or conceivably to bring down the critical infrastructure, power lines, right, the utilities, and so on. So the ability to defend against cyber attacks is a, is a critical issue in the future. And then, of course, education for the current and future workforce. Because you know, the world has moved to a, a setting where uh, we expect a, a, at least a modicum of technical capability from everybody. You, you, you have, even if you fill out a request for uh, social services, you, know, you don't get out a piece of paper and fill out a form. You have to go online and you know, go to the library, maybe. Uh, and fill out that form online and submit it. So, so the expectation that everybody has at least rudimentary t uh, capabilities as, as users of computers. And this, of course, continues what we already see, is that the, the planet becomes increasingly digital, and we have leaders and laggards. So we have a lot of uh, progress in developing nations uh, and, and communities. But, but still, you know, it's easy enough to point, even within the boundaries of the United States, there are places that don't have internet access. There are other places where internet access is dial-up. Uh, you know, last time, well, when I was in Havana, I had really, really slow uh, internet connections. And, you know, most of these modern sites that do tracking and the like, they have uh, all kinds of uh, HTTP calls that are going on before they load your page. Well, if you're trying to do that at dial-up speed, it's really, really painful. Uh, so uh, keeping in mind what our role as software engineers uh, can be and should be in maintaining and improving the global infrastructure, I think that's really uh, a key responsibility for us as software engineers. So, future and so on. This finds me. TonyWACM.org is probably the best way to find me. Um, and that's a good closing one because that's something. I'll go back one slide.